Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Claudia Golden and David Figlio. Thank you for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, to name a few. We have over 150 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. Claudia Golden is the Henry Lee Professor of Economics at Harvard University and was the director of the National Bureau of Economic Research's development of the American Economy Program from 1989 to 2017. She is a co-director of the NBER's Gender in the Economy Study Group. An economic historian and a labor economist, Professor Golden's research covers a wide range of topics, including the female labor force, the gender gap in earnings, income inequality, technological change, education, and immigration. Most of her research interprets the present through the lens of the past and explores the origins of current issues of concern. Her most recent book is Career and Family, released in October. David Figlio is the Orrington Lunt Professor and Dean of the School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University. In 2017, Professor Figlio was elected to the National Academy of Education for his work involving school accountability, standards, higher education practice, welfare policy, policy design, and the link between health and education. An economist by training, he currently serves as a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow at the IZA Institute of Labor e Economics. And now let's welcome Professor Claudia Golden and Professor David Figlio. Thank you for the kind introduction, Lani. Um, I'd like to lead off by just by saying <clears throat> what a delight it is to, um, to be hosting this particular event. The School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University is a, um, is a supporter of the Family Action Network and uh, co-host of, uh, of this event. And so it, um, it, I'm always thrilled by the extraordinary um, uh, speakers that you bring to our community. And of course, I'm particularly excited about this particular speaker. I've um, been a fanboy of Claudia's for my entire career, um, ever since I first read her work when I was a graduate student. And it's just a real privilege, Claudia, to be here, if not physically in your presence, at least uh, electronically so. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, it's, so it's, it's, I'm delighted as well. And of course, it's a mutual admiration society. Extremely sweet of you. Um, so Claudia, something I deeply appreciate about this book and about your work in general is that you emphasize the importance of understanding where we've been in order to help us make sense of where we are and where we're going. So I'd like to start in the middle of your book, which is also the middle of the 20th century. Betty Friedan's influential 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique, characterized the post-war period as a time when college-educated women's opportunities were regressing. You present evidence suggesting something very different. What would you say Friedan got right about the college-educated women who came of age from the late 40s through the early 60s, and how did she miss the mark? Okay, well, let us say that I have a considerable amount of nerve, or my people would say chutzpah, <laughs> to claim that Friedan was wrong, uh, but I'm not the only one to say so. Dan Horowitz, a very well-known historian, has done a carefully researched biography of Friedan and finds significant evidence that she bent the facts to fit her bottom line. Uh, so be it, you know, her book sold millions. By, by the way, I've checked, it's still selling at the top of the game. Uh, and it hit a really obvious nerve. Uh, so, um, but the problem is that she got a couple of things wrong. For example, uh, women in this group didn't drop out of college to get married at the rates that she claimed. I mean, there are some facts that, you know, no one expected Betty to go and, you know, crank the numbers, <laughs> but, but she really had some of the numbers that she didn't report. So in fact, they didn't drop out at, 
at as high a rate as she claimed. Plus, as a group, they actually had a higher fraction that got advanced degrees, masters, for example, than the previous group. Uh, Betty was a journalist. <laughs> she was an amazingly good and compelling writer. She wanted to portray the college educated mothers of the baby boom. That's this group that is graduating college from the mid forties to the mid to the end of the sixties. She wanted to characterize them as retrograde as backward to her. They weren't as serious. And, and, and of course she's not blaming the victim. She's blaming capitalism. <laughs> she's blaming the society, but in fact, they weren't retrograde. They were really quite forward looking. That doesn't mean that they were always happy because they weren't. They were stuck for a while at home with the kids, but they had their, what I'll call their get out of jail free cards waiting. And, uh, and so they, they, they were in some sense forward looking because they were different from the previous uh, group. And the previous group didn't have family. They had career or family. They couldn't have both, whereas this group had family and job. Thanks for that. So, you know, this group of women we were, you were just discussing, those who were born between approximately 1923 and 1943 are what you're calling group three amongst your five distinct cohorts of women who graduated from college in the 20th century. Could you spend a few minutes walking us through these five groups of women in the context of their relationships in general with marriage and children and jobs and careers? So the first thing is, is that the divisions among these groups, and we can call them birth cohorts or graduating groups, uh, the divisions are natural. They're not imposed. It's not as if I have a group that I call group X or group Y or millenniums or millennials, or they're, they come out naturally by what they aspire to and what they achieved. So let's begin with the first group. And the first group is very stark. So this is a group that's graduating college in the first two decades of the 20th century. And it clearly has career or job or family. So 50% of all the women who graduated college in those years, 50% never had a birth or an adoption. 30% uh, never married, and many of them married much later in life. So these were extreme. So they, they sort of divide into two groups. One had the potential for a career or a job. And the other one had a family and often not was not employed at all, not even when they were older. And then we morph into, we skip over group two, which is a transition group into the group that we were just talking about. And the differences between those two groups is like night and day, even though the individuals were often very similar from very, very similar backgrounds. The differences aren't that the fraction of women who graduated college increased. It isn't selection. There is something else that's going on in the ether, in the environment. And now just to complete the picture, let me shift from group three. And group three had lots of kids, married, the median age at first marriage for all these women was 23, which is scary. When I tell my undergraduates that they get very, very nervous that the median, the 50% mark is at age 23. And, uh, and this group had a very large, 90% who married had kids. That's, it's night and day compared with group one. And then from that group, the mothers of the baby boom, the group that Betty Friedan wrote about in The Feminine Mystique, from that group, the change to group four and group five, once again, is cataclysmic 
So we move from a group that is marrying at, at very young ages, even though they're graduating from college, to a group that's delaying marriage, delaying um, uh, having kids. And what are they doing? They're investing in their careers. And we move to group four, who says, I'm going to have a career. <laughs> having a family looked really easy. So that group is graduating college from the late 60s to about 1980. That's my group, group four. And they had much higher rates of career attainment, but many of them sort of forgot to have the kids, as in that famous Roy Lichtenstein print. And then we move to group five that looks at group four as if each is metaphorically passing a baton from one to the other with warnings and advice and looks at group four and says, you forgot to have the kids. I'm not going to forget to have them. I'm going to still delay marriage, delay having the kids. I'm going to get that great career, but I'm going to, I'm going to have the kids. And they did somewhat better at that. So those are the five. Where are we today? People often ask me, are we in group six? No, no, no. We're in group five plus. <laughs> so when you say group five plus, then um, <clears throat> um, I'm, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little curious. So what do you think is um, most similar about say the women who are graduating from college today, you know, so I have three daughters, they're age 28, 26 and 23 right now. Uh, so they would be in your group five plus. Um, what would be different between my daughter's generation and the group five and what might be, um, what do you think is more similar? So, from what we can see, and so I can use the, and, and I'll, I'll use our terminology of the NLSY, the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth 97, to look at that group, and I can track them to their late 30s. See, I, I don't, I don't want to uh, look at a 26-year-old, because I don't know what she's going to be doing. Neither now, do I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you have three, so you're going to have to look at them. Um, so I can see in that group that it is achieving more career and family than the previous group of, at the same age. So they're doing a little bit better, not a lot better, a little bit better. And I don't know exactly what they're going to be doing by the time they're in their 40s and 50s. Where I want to see the change and where I think I'm seeing the change is with men. So uh, more and more young men, and it's a shame you don't have sons as well, because um, you can tell me what they're thinking about. More and more young men are saying, you know what? Uh, just as the women are looking at previous generations for advice, I look at the previous generation and I see men who have regrets and who say, I should have spent more time with my kids. I want to spend more time with my kids. Another thing that I see, and I really do see it, and there is some survey evidence about it, but we really need more evidence, is that more and more men who have highly successful careers value the fact that their spouses, their wives, if they're in heterosexual couples, that their wives are their equal, that they have real relationships in which no one looks at them and says, oh, you got the career and she got all the joys from raising the kids. She gave up her career so you could have something else. That that, that, that is in some sense shaming <laughs> where it hadn't been shaming. So, so the notion that I would like to somehow do work on is that there is something which one might call the new trophy wife. And the new trophy wife is your equal. And that you do have an equitable relationship and that that's something that you want as a man. Well, um, that, that certainly resonates with me. 
personally, <laughs> but um, so. In, in fact, let, let me say that, that you and I as economists, maybe there are some other economists in this, in this group can write down a very, very long list of couples, both of whom are economists and who have kids who went through ups and downs in their careers a little bit, some of them not too many downs, but some of them. And they are actually household names, George Akerlof and Janet Yellen, for example, or Essa Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, winners of the Nobel Prize, um, Christy Romer and David Romer, and I could go on and on and on. And these are couples who've had families and um, Susan Athey, for example, as well, three, three children. And so, okay. Yeah, it won't surprise me if Susan, Susan Athey joins her husband as a Nobelist before too long either. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's exactly right. On the other hand, we also, unfortunately, can probably name an awful lot of couples in which, um, in which um, the uh, female, the female member of that couple um, ended up getting derailed from their career and the male member is, has continued on. I have a few minutes, I have a question uh, about that that might dig into that a little bit too. Um, so, you know, one of the things I was, just this weekend, I was having this conversation. I was actually um, uh, together in person, wonderfully, with my uh, 26 year old daughter. And my 26 year old daughter was um, citing this oft cited statistic um, uh, regarding the gender earnings gap. Um, people often say things like women earn 82 cents for every dollar that men earn. Um, I'd love for you to let's start by you breaking this down a bit for us. How much of this gender earnings gap is due to sorting across occupations and how much is due to sorting within occupations? Sure, great question. So the first thing we have to do is confront what the 82 cents means, where it comes from. It's a statistic that has gotten computed. So we generally express the gender earnings gap by a single number. And we do that because we want single numbers, okay? We don't want a whole range of numbers, but in fact, it is a whole range of numbers and I'll get to that. So the number is gonna be uh, much larger, in fact, pretty close to one when we both graduate from, from uh, law school. And then it's gonna stay high until we have kids and then it's gonna go down and then it's gonna stay down for a while. Maybe it'll come up a little bit, but probably, so therefore it's not a single number, but let's go with the single number for a second. So where does it come from? Well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS has been producing this number for a very long time. And therefore it's really nice because we can connect the dots and make a trend. So what is it? It is the ratio of female to male weekly earnings for those working full-time year round. Furthermore, the ratio is for the median woman divided by the median man. So that's what it is. We construct it, then we divide it, and that's our number. So it's less than the actual numbers because there's some attempt to control for hours worked. There's an attempt to trim the long right tail, the big amount of earnings at the very top. Computed this way, there's been great progress. So particularly in the 1980s, women's earnings rose relative to men's by a substantial amount. Remember the saying in the 19, early 1970s was 59 cents on the dollar. We deserve more than that. Well, 82 cents is more than 59 cents. And a lot of how we got there was in the 1980s. And much of the progress came about because education levels for women advanced. And in addition, what they did in college changed. They were 
no longer majoring in subjects that one might think of as consumption subjects. They were majoring in subjects that were investment subjects like economics and like, well, not enough economics. Business was the big change. Um, they prepared themselves better for demanding jobs. They stayed in the workforce more. Their labor force participation increased. But of course, there's considerable frustration because there hasn't been more. And the, frust the frustration has been expressed in terms of doing something about, you name it, sexual harassment, biased managers, the absence of information on the salaries of others, pay transparency. But although these are noble goals, they are not going to make that, that big a difference. Now, you mentioned occupational segregation, and that once mattered in this computation a lot more than it does now. And today, in fact, there's more going on within large occupational groups than differences across. So take, for example, lawyers. So two lawyers, one might work in a large law firm on Park Avenue, which is in New York City, and the other one might work in a boutique law firm that does family law. They, they are going to have differences in earnings that are enormously large. And the same thing for even for physicians, for academics, for accountants, and even for sales workers. So your book, I think at the core of your book is something that really gets into helping to explain why that phenomenon you were just describing is. Why are some attorneys earning so much more than other attorneys or some um, physicians earning so much more than other physicians? And it's this concept that you're calling greedy work. Could you please tell us what greedy work entails and what is it about our economy that's driving this greediness today? Right, and, and probably greedy work has always existed, but it's bigger today because uh, income inequality is so much larger. But greedy work, so let me define what I mean by it. So it can be defined as a position, a job that pays disproportionately more on a per hour basis when the individual works a greater number of hours or when the individual has less control over those hours. So it could be that I want you to do a rush job. I want you to take care of that taxing client who calls at 11 p.m. and says, I want Figlio. <laughs> or a supervisor who asks that the worker give up a vacation for a project or not be home for dinner with the kids. So the firm has deemed that the additional payment is worth it to have the work done over more hours or at a particular time or during these particularly odd and valuable hours to the, to the worker. The other critical aspect of this is that the worker in fact agrees to do it at that wage. So it's supply and demand, and it's a complicated equilibrium in which compensation may be insufficient for some workers to do this. Let's say that they are disproportionately women. And to do this means giving up their time, giving up part of their family life, in fact, if they have kids, someone is going to have to be the on-call at home parent. That, that individual could still have a demanding job, but they're not gonna be able to have the greedy, greedy job. But the compensation may be sufficient for other workers. Let's say they're disproportionately men to do that. And under these conditions, women with caregiving responsibilities, and these don't necessarily just have to do with children they could be for other family members, they will shift to firms with less demanding hours and, and the number of hours could still be the same. It's just that they're more in control and that's what we mean by flexibility. Uh, or some women may leave the workforce altogether. So in many professions, women work in firms or for institutions 
that are less demanding of their time. For example, they're disproportionately in our field in academia, they're disproportionately adjunct faculty rather than tenure track professors. They work for smaller accounting firms. They work for smaller law firms than men do. They're in finance occupations like HR, which has different hours than investment banking. Uh, they gain various amenities in their work, but they also earn less. And not only do they earn less today, but they'll probably earn less in the future as well. Yeah, thank you um, for that. I mean, it, you make it pretty clear how this um, phenomenon of greedy work can really end up leading to gender inequality, especially if, um, if in our society, um, the people who are disproportionately not willing to pay the price for the greedy work are female identifying. Um, so now in your book, you contrast two professions, lawyers and pharmacists. Um, and I found, <clears throat> I actually found this to be um, perhaps the most, for me personally, perhaps the most interesting chapter of the whole book. So um, uh, in this contrast, you describe the conditions that led the pharmacy field to be much more gender equitable than the legal field. Can you tell us about what these conditions are? And which professions do you see as others where organizations can drive greater gender equity? And which professions are likely amongst the hardest to change? Sure. So first I'll tell you a little bit about why pharmacy changed and this will come uh, somewhat as a surprise. Uh, and the reason is that it changed for three reasons and none of them has to do with individuals clamoring for change. In other cases, and, and I have some examples, for example, in pediatrics, the changes really were changes that came about because individuals voted with their feet. So let me just explain what happened in, in pharmacy. So in pharmacy, the changes are what one might think of as sort of organic. Some of these changes, I think many people, uh, possibly some people in the audience will uh, find surprising and in fact will say that they're not very happy about these changes because they have to do with the increase in large corporations. So there was a time when a pharmacist owned his own business. And I, I know there are women who own pharmacies, but in general, it was men who owned pharmacies. Women were always being trained as pharmacists. And uh, so the pharmacist who owned the business often hired other pharmacists as assistants and that often that pharmacist was a woman and she would earn therefore a, a nice salary but she would earn far less than he did largely because he was what we considered the residual claimant. He would take on the risks and the time commitment of ownership. He, he would, you know, he was the, the little CEO of his little company. Um, but many changes occurred that brought about the decrease in the fraction of independently owned pharmacies. I must say that I still go to an independently owned pharmacy for anyone that's run by three brothers. So the Skindarians is the greatest pharmacy around just in case anyone lives in the Cambridge area. And um, plus the fact that they give little dog biscuits to my dog. And so anytime I go by there with my dog, he pulls me into the pharmacy. Okay, I have to get my mask out. And then he gets his biscuit. Um, so, so there was the rise of the corporate model associated with everyone's favorite CBS, Walgreens, Rite Aid. And pharmacists became, at the same time, they became better substitutes for each other. And this was the second change. So the first was the rise of the corporate um, model. The second one is that pharmacists, first of all, pharmacists 
are extraordinarily well-trained. They're very highly remunerated. They are our first line of defense in terms of our health. And I used to say that, and people would say, really? And now everyone says, well, of course, they give me my shot. I just got my booster shot in <laughs> by the pharmacist. So pharmacists became much better substitutes for each other sometime in the last 50, 60 years through what? Through the standardization of drugs. And they also became very good substitutes by the third change here, which is the elaborate use of information technologies. Okay. So when you go to the pharmacist, the pharmacist on their computer knows, should know all of the medications you are taking, even if that pharmacist never had anything to do with those medications. That is better information than your physician has about you generally. <laughs> so pharmacists today no longer receive the financial rewards or have the time demands of ownership. And the gender earnings gap for hourly earnings in pharmacy is among the lowest among high paying occupations, even though a substantial fraction of female pharmacists do work part-time at some point in their career. I think that's really, I think that's really fascinating. And, and, um, <clears throat> and I guess the related to that question then, I mean, um, are there other major professions that, that are, are characterized by similar types of, um, similar types of at attributes where, um, uh, where we're high paid, but relatively corporatized and are pretty interchangeable with one another and, um, and have technology that facilitates that or is pharmacy really very special in that regard? I, we can find many. So we, I can talk about pediatricians, anesthesiologists, obstetricians, which is a really interesting one, family doctors. So there are many in the, in the health area. Veterinarians is also one of my favorite ones. I could see you have a Muffy walking around in front of you. So Muffy, which can either be a cat or a dog. <laughs> Muffy uh, uh, in the 1970s, for example, 1980s, when Muffy got sick, really, really sick, and Muffies always get sick at 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> never at two in the afternoon. Uh, so you would call up your veterinarian and your veterinarian had a small practice <clears throat> and your veterinarian would come in and, and take care of Muffy unless the veterinarian said, well, Muffy is like, you know, 22 years old, that's it. <laughs> But now when you call up your veterinarian at 11 o'clock at night, you get a recording and the recording tells you exactly which regional animal hospital to go to. And throughout America, there may be some places that are not covered, but in many parts of America, there are these regional animal hospitals, which is the same thing for us. If you got sick at 11 o'clock at night, you wouldn't call up your doctor and say, Marcus Welby, MD, come and take care of me. You know, you, you would go to an, an emergency department. So what happened in veterinary medicine is sort of, it's, it's another type of change. And of course, now also in veterinary medicine, there's a lot of corporate ownership as well. But it meant that veterinarians did not sign on to be around in the greedy hour times, that there was this special group of people who, who uh, took turns <laughs> to do the graveyard shift and who were the specialists who took care of Muffy when Muffy got sick. The same thing in pediatrics, you know, it made absolutely no sense for a family to have one pediatrician because chances are going to be <laughs> that the kid is gonna need help when that pediatrician isn't around. So group practices are good for the pediatrician and they're good for the parents, they're good for the child. It's funny, I'm smiling in part because um, my sister-in-law 
who's a veterinarian in Tallahassee, Florida, is the veterinarian equivalent to your uh, pharmacist, your set of pharmacist brothers. Um, and she probably is, um, I think, probably the self-imposed, engaged in the self-imposed greediest uh, work amongst Tallahassee veterinarians. Um, but uh, on the other hand, she has this incredibly loyal um, following, but she's one of these people who um, um, kind of like that Roy Lichtenstein. Um, <laughs> it's like she had her career and forgot to have the family, right? Um, so it's, it's um, the, the, we see that type of, we see that type of thing happening. I, on the other hand, had my first kid at 23. So, um, so well, I, I, you know, sometimes it's that the fact that you had your, I don't know what the age is, but, but it took the pressure off her maybe from having the kids. Um, but let, let me also say that there are always veterinarians who, um, uh, who take care of large animals. And I don't want to leave out those, those veterinarians because they still you know, it's very hard to bring those large animals to the regional animal hospital. So those are the ones who uh, still work uh, the 24-7. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, you know, you were talking a little while ago about, about you know, the, the, um, the, some of the men of group five and a half or five plus. Um, and how um, we're seeing more and more male identifying members of couples um, um, really wanting to have these marriages of equals. So suppose you're, you're speaking to some um, couples from uh, some, some of these couples in generation five and a half right now, um, what can couples do to reduce the risk of gender imbalance around career and family? And what maybe is the cost that couples who value this balance are likely to pay? Yeah, so, um, so I, what, what I say in the book is that what I've described is that uh, couple inequity is giving rise to gender inequality. And of course, that's for heterosexual couples. Same-sex couples, uh, and thank you very much, <laughs> they might have couple inequity, but they don't give rise to gender uh, inequality. So, um, so it's, it's the heterosexual couples who, when they give up couple equity, they essentially throw gender inequality under the bus <laughs> with, with, couple, uh, uh, with couple equity. So, um, it's, so what I would advise, and I, and I rarely give advice to anyone, <laughs> so, but what I would advise is that um, before you sign on the dotted line with whatever uh, spouse, heterosexual, same-sex, whatever, that you, um, that, that you think much harder about the long run and, and think much harder about, uh, about how to share sort of over the, over the long run. And that it may be that you'll get together and you realize that it is worth giving up 30,000 a year or 20,000, maybe not a half a million, but there's, there's probably some amount that you could deal with so that you have an equitable relationship. I know couples who decided to do it serially that's a very, very hard thing to commit to. And in fact, uh, uh, one of them was my colleague at the University of Pennsylvania and his wife uh, was a, is a professor of English. And their agreement was that when she gets uh, the tenured offer that he would leave and he would go to whatever place 
would hire him. That's a hard thing to commit to, but in fact, uh, in fact, he did it. So the first thing is that couples should talk at the start of their serious relationship about this. They should recognize that careers are long, that they have considerable path dependence. They should think harder about the value of spending time with family and the cost of regrets. Perhaps, as I said, it is worth the 30K a year to have couple equity and to share the joys. I mean, it's also that, as I said before, that men in a heterosexual couple have to realize that by going the greedy route, they really are giving something up. It's not simply that she's giving something up. They are really giving something up. You know, thanks for that. In fact, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, as, an, as economists, we're very used to thinking about these, these types of trade-offs. And I think it's worth pausing for just a second to say, we make these types of choices all the time along all sorts of other dimensions. You and I are, um, by choosing to be um, academic economists, for example, uh, left a lot of money on the table. We could have chosen a very different, um, a diff very different career that was much more financially remunerative, but um, than being a college professor. But at the same time, would have had brought with it other types of. Uh, job attributes that and lifestyle attributes that we didn't appreciate and so and so in in that regard why is it I guess it's an interesting challenge for couples to decide what are they willing to just like everything else what are you willing to give up I also have to say one thing I just want to I know they're not paying attention but I just want to um quell about my um youngest daughter's um, serious boyfriend right now because my youngest daughter decided in uh, 2020 to go to to um, uh, pursue graduate studies in a very different city and uh, he said well I'll follow you where you go and I say I, I told her um, all right I'm not saying you should marry this guy but uh, I just want you to know that dad is really very uh, pleased by this particular um, this particular turn of events here he's wonderful and so is she um, so you know many solutions aimed at promoting equity and these could be either at the policy level or at the organizational level involve the use of what I would call a universal remedy Sadly, we know that many universal remedies aimed at promoting equity end up reinforcing inequities. So in our profession of economics, for example, uh, Heather Anticole and Kelly Bedard and Jenna Stearns had a very famous recent paper in which they found that universally stopping tenure clocks following the birth of a child, which is something that just about every university, including my own Northwestern has done, regarding COVID disruptions as well, tended to help new fathers and hurt new mothers. What are some attributes of successful solutions that are either universal or targeted? Yeah, I love that paper. Um, I will admit to this group, I refereed it. it. It had gotten rejected many times. And, and part of it was that this was the type of paper where the people who wrote it had some idea that there was something there and they meticulously collected the data. And so it came under a lot of attack by people who thought that, you know, wasn't a lot of data, it was collected in a non-random fashion or something, but they persisted, they persisted. And there were a number, I, I'm certainly not the only referee of this, of this paper. And there were obviously those who, who rejected it but it, I like it a tremendous amount. So for those in the audience who don't know what we're talking about, so universities, uh, when they began having parental leave, uh, so this is stop, uh, stop the clock. So you, um, you have a parental, someone has a baby, generally a woman, and, uh, and, and uh, the university, she's on a tenure track, and so she's maybe in her fourth year in a six year 
uh, contract. She'll come up for tenure at year six, and now she's taking a lot of time out. So how do we make her whole again? Well, making her whole again is to say, we will uh, give, we'll stop your clock for a year and give you a leave, okay? So universities began doing that, and then they scratched their heads and they said, we can't do that. We have to give both the mother and the father, or if there are two mummies or two daddies, all of them. We want to encourage uh, good families. And of course, it may be that the mother isn't the faculty member, only the daddy is the faculty member. And so what they discovered in this paper was that they discovered something. It's a dirty little secret that every academic knows, which is that the women who have their clock stopped and take the year off, take care of the kids, and the men continue to do their research. So it shows how difficult equitable solutions are and how there are often unintended consequences from policies. There are tons of policies that we can list that have incentives. Many of the incentives, we would know in advance what they are. So for example, welfare policies that reduce funding when there was a resident man in the house. Tell me what that's going to do. Or income taxes that essentially reduce labor supply. Um, one that, that is one of my favorites, which is seatbelt use. Seatbelts are really great, but of course what they, the unintended consequence is that people then feel more secure and they drive faster and more dangerously because after all, I not only have a seatbelt, but I have an airbag. So, um, but one of the differences in this case, and I'll just say it simply, is that this is fraud. This is actual fraud. So it's as simple as that faculty who took parental leave was supposed to be caring for their newborns. So it yeah. just shows, it shows something that everyone should realize that um, I, and I'm sure you too, probably more than I am asked, what is the right policy for this? And I think we should realize that, that it's just a huge amount of hubris to think that we economists or people in Washington walk around with magic wands and they wave them over things and what they want to happen happens without the potential unintended consequence. Brilliant people making policy have to sort of sit back and say, I have to do this to get around these unintended consequences. And that's really hard. Yeah, no, it, it's, it, it, it is because, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's like, well, I mean, I think about this all the time as a dean, especially trying to figure out how to equity in my own institution, right? I mean, you, you know, thinking, okay, well, which is worse, right? doing something with first doing something that might have some negative unintended consequences or doing nothing and seeing what comes out and sometimes it, the, the thing with the negative unintended consequences are worse and sometimes it's the better of two optimal situations so um so i i think that and by the way, I love this paper too. I was a positive referee on that paper at a previous unsuccessful, a, a previous unsuccessful submission. And, and so I was so thrilled when that got published in the American Economic Review um, um, because it, I, I think it's exactly the type of paper, it, it's had precisely the effect on our profession that I was hoping it would have and you were hoping it would have. But, Turns out you were yeah, more in, in addition, you know, similar to the paper that I did with Cecilia Rouse, we went and collected the data meticulously going from orchestra to orchestra. And for those in the audience who don't know what I'm talking about, it had to do with the impact of blind auditions on orchestral hiring. So 
chances are we're going to have smaller samples, larger standard errors, and every now and then there's some someone who you know some someone who guards p values <laughs> i won't say who it is who will say oh but you know your you know your your standard errors are large yeah that's what happens when you try to answer questions that are difficult for which you have to go and collect your own data yeah, no, I agree. So by the way, when uh, Lani starts asking you questions in a couple of minutes uh, from Q&A from the audience, I'll quickly go and get some links and I'll stick them in the chat about both that uh, Antical Badar and Stearns. Oh, uh, they're, they're in the chat already. David. Oh, they are? Oh, see, yep. that's great. Okay, yep. super. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, uh, I, I told you that I would look at the chat. <laughs> So, uh, okay, well, well, your paper with C.C. Rallis also orchestrating impartiality, I love that paper. So, um, um, uh, so if that paper doesn't show up in the chat, I'll make sure I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll find it really quickly. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'll sure. hand it over to Lani. And that is, um, as we near the start of the third year of this pandemic, the burdens of which have been disproportionately borne by women and especially women of color. It's often really hard to see silver linings. But now that we're in what you call the ACDC world, that's after Corona, during Corona, do you see any lessons that we've been learning about how we might be able to come out of this pandemic with increased opportunities for gender equity? Sure. Um... Yeah, it's it's a little depressing to say we're in our third year, but gosh, the bubonic plague lasted for centuries. <laughs> but we have science, okay? So, uh, so this this is where I think we're we're coming out on the other side better. Um, that we do have, I think, a far better understanding of the role of care for children, for the elderly for sick family members. We have a better understanding, uh, I hope, of the mental burden of being both the caregiver and the household manager. We've begun a national conversation that we haven't had in a really long time, if we ever had one. I mean, we uh, I could go back to 1943 and discuss the national conversation we had when we needed women to enter the labor force during World War II, and we realized that they couldn't enter the labor force because they had these little kids that they were leaving in cars or alone. And so we, uh, we took funds that were for internal improvements uh, and the, in the Lanham Act, uh, and we, we put them into uh, nursery uh, schools, into, um, really, really good nursery schools. So um, we have a far better understanding of the extreme risks of not having a sick leave policy, for example. Let's not forget about that, that we now know, and this is due to some amazing work by economists, of the huge number of nursing home residents who died because we didn't have a sick leave policy. We also have a better understanding that the low rate of pay of those workers meant that they were working in several nursing homes. And that's what spread the disease. Both of these things spread the disease and killed a, a horrendous number of individuals. So um, that's part of the silver lining. Part of the silver lining is that we've been shaken to recognize something that we should have recognized. But the other part is that we coordinated on a use of technology such as the one that we're using right now that we had before. We didn't have it 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but we had it before the, the pandemic. We could always have, you know, I run a seminar, you run seminars. We could always have invited that person from Hong Kong, but we didn't because we hadn't coordinated on this new equilibrium. And for the greedy work, what it means is that uh, flexible work has become more productive and greedy work has become more flexible. You don't have to fly to Tokyo 
to do that mergers and acquisitions. You don't have to fly to Paris to sign the contract. And the more firms realize this, and they have, uh, the more, as I said, the flexible job, the price of flexibility is going down and the greedy job doesn't have to be as greedy. You can uh, live in Idaho and work in Silicon Valley. So all of that has meant that um, there are silver linings in our ACDC world. Okay. Thank you for a great conversation, uh, David. I can call you David because we share a birthday. We see our we see each other sometimes on our birthday, which is kind of nice. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Golden. Really lovely to learn from you. There's so many nuances to your research that we have only just skimmed, and I do mean skimmed the surface in this last hour. Uh, the book itself is very deep and has a lot of um, incredible, um, you know how it would generalize across to people um, in, in various disciplines is, is kind of stunning. I wanna ask one, there's two questions in chat. So I'm gonna go with Carolyn's first. She says, given your expertise in family and gender dynamics and their economic impacts, I'm curious whether you've examined domestic violence and the related economic fallout, mostly for women, how it can perpetuate gender inequality over generations. That's a very, very good question. And, and I would say that um, I haven't studied domestic violence. There are many uh, economists who have, and I am not in that group. However, I, it is certainly my sense that everything gender begins with women's greater vulnerability. Their greater vulnerability because of the differences in earning power and because women are the protectors of their children. And that certainly can lead to and produce domestic violence because women can be the notion of vulnerability is that they are captive and they don't have options. So, um, so this is an, uh, a broad area <laughs> that we would put within the subject of patriarchy <laughs> and, and build something much, much larger about. But there are uh, many, in fact, um, I, I in fact ran a conference on uh, vulnerabilities and victimization during COVID. Uh, uh, people from uh, in countries around the world uh, remarked that this was the shadow pandemic. The shadow pandemic was that women were stuck in places and couldn't get out. So they became, those who were vulnerable before became more vulnerable and became more victimized. So thank you very, very much for raising an issue that I haven't raised, but I know is extremely important and really at the root of gender issues. I want to remind everyone watching that we're going to be doing after hours tonight um, with Professor Golden and Professor Figlio. Both will be there. Uh, we've been putting in chat the link to purchase a copy of um, Professor Golden's new book, which is right here, Career and Family. Purchase a copy. The book's still there. You go. Thank you, Professor Figlio. Um, when the books, when you in your receipt, you'll get a link from the bookstall with a way to register for that second Zoom. We're gonna give these nice folks uh, a good five minute break in between these two Zooms so that they can um, get a glass of water and, and relax for a minute. And then we'll be starting that Zoom in just a minute. Um, I wanna thank you so much for your service to FAN and for closing out our 2021 year with such a, a thoughtful topic. Um, Professor Figlio, thank you so much. I know you had a, a long day and we are very grateful for the partnership of SESPE with FAN as well. We wanna thank you for everything that you do for that as well. Thank you very much.